Hello and welcome to our final lesson on Chapter 15, Oxidative Phosphorylation. We'll be looking at ATP synthase and the PO ratio. ATP synthase is also called the FOF1 ATP synthase. Notice this is FO, not F0. O because it's sensitive to oligomycin. This is the portion, the FO domain, that's actually embedded in the mitochondrial membrane. This is the portion of the protein that actually translocates protons from the inner membrane space to the matrix side. The F1 domain is the portion that kind of looks like a lollipop, and that's where we're actually going to make ATP. As mentioned in the last lesson, it's sometimes called complex 5 because it's so tightly coupled to electron transport, and of course our last component in that chain is complex 4. It was Ephraim Racker who first purified and identified the function of the F1 domain. It was John Walker who shared the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1997 through his work in helping to solve the ATP synthase structure. And here's a more detailed representation of that structure here. So here's our mitochondrial membrane. Here's the P side where we're accumulating protons and we're going to translocate those back into the matrix, the N side. Here's our FO cylinder. As you can see, it's composed of multiple C subunits, identical. In this case, there are 10, though it does depend on the species and the nature of the ATP synthase as far as how many C subunits it contains. It's this portion that rotates, as illustrated here. One proton per C subunit, and as it translocates that proton, it rotates. As you can see in the black arrow here, it rotates in the counterclockwise direction. So this is the portion of the structure that's rotating. Here's our F1 portion, as you can see, composed of a trimer of dimers, that is alpha, beta, alpha, beta, alpha, beta subunits. And the two are connected, that is FO and F1, through the central shaft pictured here in green. It's our gamma shaft. It's more directly connected to an epsilon subunit. The important thing to keep in mind here is that it's the FO portion that rotates. Because the gamma shaft is connected to those C cylinders, it rotates along with the C cylinders. However, the alpha beta subunits of F1 are fixed relative to the membrane because they're directly connected to these B subunits. Here's a top-down view of the F1 portion from the inside, a ribbon diagram, and you can see these alternating alpha beta subunits. It's actually the beta subunit that binds the nucleotide, although the location uh, which binds the nucleotides pretty close to the alpha subunit, pretty close to that interface. So here we have one beta subunit bound to ADP in yellow, a separate B subunit, beta subunit bound to ATP, and one beta subunit that's empty. So clearly differing affinities for ADP and ATP. And yet these beta subunits are identical. Primary, secondary, and tertiary structure identical. The only thing that's different is their conformation, and that has to do with their connection to that central gamma shaft, and that's pictured here in this green helix. So how does this work? Well, it was Paul Boyer who shared that Nobel Prize in 1997 because of his elucidation of this mechanism. It's called rotational catalysis because it's the turn of that shaft that drives synthesis. So remember, it's the FO cylinder embedded in the membrane that translocates those protons. As it does so, the cylinder turns and along with it that gamma shaft. Remember, that alpha beta core is fixed. So as that shaft turns, it contacts a different beta subunit and that's why the conformations differ. So three possible conformations pictured on the right here. Our gamma shaft is pictured as this purple triangle here. The, the subunit that it is directly contacting, it converts to the conformation O or open where it has a low affinity for both ATP and ADP. It's 
differently connected to the other beta subunits. On one, it converts it to a tight conformation in which it's tightly bound to ATP. The other is in the L conformation in which it's loosely bound to the substrates. Let's see what happens as we translocate protons and rotate that gamma shaft counterclockwise. As you can see, it changes the beta subunit that was in the T conformation to an O conformation and it thereby releases ATP. The one that was in the L conformation changes to a T conformation and that's what catalyzes the synthesis of ATP. At the same time, it changes the conformation of the O beta subunit to L, in which case it has a high affinity for substrates. Let's turn that gamma shaft one more time, 120 degrees. Again, T becomes O and releases ATP. O becomes L and binds substrates. And L becomes T and makes ATP. So as that gamma shaft makes one full rotation in that F1 domain, it contacts each of those three beta subunits and each one in turn will make ATP. So one full rotation, three ATP molecules produced. It takes about three protons to pump for each ATP that's made. If we separate the F1 domain, remember that's the portion that actually catalyzes the synthesis of ATP. If we separate that from FO, it actually catalyzes ATP hydrolysis. But not too surprising when we consider that from a thermodynamic point of view, hydrolysis is highly favored over synthesis. So if there is no FO domain, there's nothing to drive rotation of that gamma shaft we're re relying on the translocation of protons to fund or give us the energy to make ATP. If we can't translocate protons, then we can't make ATP. So the bottom line if, is, if there is no proton gradient, we can't make ATP by this method. So the electron transport system creates the proton gradient, the ATP synthase uses it. They're tightly coupled, but not directly. It's akin to what we saw in Chapter 9 in the case of secondary active transport. One transporter sets up the gradient, another one uses it. So in this case, the electron transport system sets up the proton gradient and the ATP synthase uses it. Well, how much ATP can we make in this way? This is referred to as the PO ratio. The P has to do with the number of phosphorylations of ADP to make ATP. And how does that relate to the number of oxygen molecules that got reduced? In other words, the number of electrons transferred. So if we start with NADH and we transfer those electrons through complex 1 down to our final component, down to our terminal acceptor oxygen, in the process we move two electrons, we pump 10 protons, and we've half reduced our oxygen molecule. The mitochondrial ATP synthase has eight C subunits in its FO domain. And remember, one proton is pumped or translocated through each of those C subunits. So one full rotation means eight protons pumped, and in that full rotation we've made three ATP molecules, or 2.7 protons for one ATP. So our PO ratio in that case is slightly more than three. In other words, 10 protons pumped, and it takes 2.7 protons to make one ATP. So our PO ratio is 3.7. However, if we start with complex 2, we haven't used complex 1, and remember complex 2 does not pump protons. So we're essentially starting at QH2. In that case, then, we only pump 6 protons when we half reduce oxygen. So our PO ratio is reduced to 2.2. This is another good lesson on if we pump fewer protons, we get less energy, we make less ATP. You'll notice it's never a whole integer, and that's because we pump an even number of protons, but we make an odd number of ATPs. The actual PO ratio in the cell is slightly less than this, because some of the proton gradient is dissipated by other processes. 
This concludes our studies on Chapter 15, Oxidative Phosphorylation. Our next chapter, Chapter 16, deals with the subject of photosynthesis. And in our first video lesson for Chapter 16, we'll look first at the organelle within which photosynthesis takes place. We'll also look at some of the types of molecules that are involved in capturing sunlight.